Good morning. The Committee on Homeland Security Subcommittee on Oversight and Management Efficiency will come to order. The purpose of this hearing is to examine the Department of Homeland Security's headquarters consolidation project. The chair now recognizes himself for an opening statement. Last month, DHS celebrated its 15-year anniversary, an important milestone for the department and a reminder of the progress that has been made in securing the homeland since 9-11. Despite significant accomplishments, organizational and management challenges continue to hinder DHS's ability to operate as a fully matured agency. Perhaps no other initiative has come to symbolize this more than DHS's ongoing headquarters consolidation project at the historic St. Elizabeth campus in southeast Washington, D.C. In 2006, then DHS, DHS Secretary Michael Chertoff outlined a vision to unify core DHS headquarters and component facilities spread across the national capital region into a consolidated location in order to improve mission effectiveness, increase organizational efficiency, and save taxpayer dollars. The department, in coordination with the U.S. General Service Administration, or GSA, developed plans to utilize a combination of new construction and the rehabilitation of existing historic structures to build a department-wide headquarters at St. Elizabeth by 2016 at an estimated cost of $3.26 billion. Unfortunately, today, two years past the original scheduled completion date, this vision is still very far from reality. From the onset, or the outset, the project at St. Elizabeth has been plagued by a multitude of setbacks that have led to significant cost overruns and scheduled delays. For example, rehabilitation of the center building, which will house the executive leadership of the department, has encountered numerous delays due to the extensive deterioration of the building's historic structure. Additionally, DHS and GSA have consistently failed to proactively respond to shifting fiscal and construction realities throughout the project's duration, suggesting persistent program management shortcomings. In 2013, Concerns over progress at St. Elizabeth led this committee to request that the U.S. Government Accountability Office conduct a performance audit of the project. GAO's audit revealed that DHS and GSA plans did not conform with leading capital decision-making practices, failed to conform with leading cost and schedule estimating practices, and had not been updated to reflect economic challenges and innovative workplace efficiencies. Following GAO's audit, the committee legislation, committee legislation was signed into law codifying several GAO recommendations, which sought to address some of the foundational management issues crippling the Consolidated Headquarters Project and to get St. Elizabeth's back on track. This law, Public Law 114-150, also required DHS to submit to Congress updated information relating to the St. Elizabeth Project by September of 2016. However, over a year and a half later, DHS and GSA have failed to comply with the requirements prescribed by the law and have not fully implemented other related recommendations made by GAO. DHS and GSA are currently operating under the DHS Headquarters Consolidation Enhanced Plan implemented in 2015, which scaled back the original plans for St. Elizabeth's. The enhanced plan reduced the expected cost of the project from $4.5 billion to $3.7 billion and set a new completion date of 2021. Not surprisingly, the latest reports already have this plan behind schedule and at risk of going over budget. As things currently stand, over a decade after consolidation was originally conceived, only the U.S. Coast Guard has moved to St. Elizabeth and lingering occupancy issues with the Coast Guard's Monroe Building have marred even this phase of the project. The Enhanced Plan's proposal for a reconfiguration of the Monroe Building to increase occupancy, occupancy has been met with concern from the Coast Guard and still has not yet been executed despite receiving full funding in FY 2016. With no end in sight, I am concerned that despite the President's FY 2019 combined DHS and GSA budget request of over $400 million for St. Elizabeth's headquarters consolidation is no longer a priority for the Department. It sure seems like way, that way. DHS has real challenges to overcome, to be sure, from securing the border to guarding our nation's critical infrastructure from cyber attacks. Building office space should not be one of those challenges. 
After nearly a decade of failure, the American people simply deserve better. It is past time, it is long past time, for DHS and GSA to take responsibility at St. Elizabeth's. If headquarters consolidation remains a priority, continued mismanagement moving forward is unacceptable. The mission of DHS is too, is too important and it is imperative for the future success of the agency that the office space housing the department's headquarters is able to meet mission requirements. I want to thank our panel for appearing uh, before the subcommittee this morning on this very important issue. I look forward to receiving an update on construction, cost and occupancy at St. Elizabeth's and learning why DHS and GSA have failed to fully implement the requirements of public law 114-150. The chair now recognizes the ranking minority member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Correa, for his statement. Good morning and thank you, Chairman Perry, for holding this hearing on Department of Homeland Security's consolidation, headquarters consolidation project, and I thank the witnesses for being here today. I'm disappointed uh, not to have Undersecretary uh, for Management with us here today. Uh, the Undersecretary oversees the department's budget and is responsible for management and administration of the department. It would have been useful to hear her version and her vision of plans for Saint, the, this St. Elizabeth's project. At previous hearings on this issue, the Undersecretary's testimony shed significant light on the department's plans and priorities for the project and how Congress could best support this project. Uh, much has been said about DHS's inability to effectively consolidate these offices and components at the St. Elizabeth campus. However, many do not recognize that while Congress authorized the project, it did not fully fund it. But uh, let's start at the beginning. Uh, what are the reasons for the consolidation today? What were the reasons for consolidation originally? Our national security. We moved in this direction because we all agreed that it was most efficient to protect our country to protect our citizens if we consolidated all functions in one centralized location. It's my understanding that even General Kelly, when he was Secretary of Homeland, complained that moving, commuting from one building to the other to try to address management issues was very inefficient. And I have to ask all of you here today, is our objective still to protect the homeland? Is our top priority still to protect American citizens and taxpayers. And if that is our objective, is consolidation of these buildings, consolidations of these departments under one centralized location still the most effective way of protecting our citizens? And if it is, what's the problem? It's my understanding this project is essentially scheduled to cost about $4 billion. It's also my understanding that we've already invested about $2 billion of taxpayer dollars towards this project. It's also my understanding that we spend about $1.6 billion annually on leases in the Washington, D.C. area for various buildings to perform these projects. It's also about $400 million a year that we spend for a peak and maintenance. So if we take 1.6 plus 4, that's about $2 billion a year that we spend just on leasing buildings throughout D.C. to do this function. Now, if I pencil it out, $2 billion a year, it takes us another $2 billion, $3 billion to complete this project. What's the payback? In about two or three years, we break even, and we get more efficient operation of Homeland Security for the benefit, for the safety of our taxpayers. I want to hear from the witnesses here today, first of all, what went wrong? Number two, how do we get back on track? And of course, number three, most importantly, is consolidation of all these operations in one place, St. Elizabeth, still the most effective way of protecting American citizens, of protecting taxpayers from those that would do us harm? Mr. Chairman, I yield. Chair, thanks to the ranking member. Other members of the subcommittee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. We are pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today. The entire witness 
the witnesses' entire written statements will appear in the record. The chair will introduce the witnesses first and then recognize each of the witnesses for their testimony. Mr. Thomas Chalecki is the Chief Readiness Support Officer for the Department of Homeland Security. Mr. Chalecki has served in a variety of readiness and mission support roles at DHS headquarters and the Coast Guard. Mr. Chalecki retired as a colonel in the Air Force Reserve, having served as a civil engineer. Mr. Chalecki, we thank you for your service. Mr. Michael Gelber is the Deputy Commissioner of the Public Building Service for GSA. Mr. Gelber has overseen major federal acquisitions in the United States and abroad since joining GSA in 1988. Thank you, sir. Mr. Christopher Curry is the Director of Emergency Management, National Preparedness, and Critical Infrastructure Protection on the GAO's Homeland Security and Justice Team. We thank you for your service and your attendance here. Thank you all for being here today. The chair now recognizes Mr. Chalecki for an opening statement. Chairman Perry, Ranking Member Correa, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Department of Homeland Security's consolidated headquarters at St. Elizabeth's. I am Tom Chalecki, Chief Readiness Support Officer for DHS. My responsibilities include the oversight and management of the Department's facilities and real property and the consolidation of DHS facilities in the National Capital Region. I'm pleased to appear with my colleagues from the General Services Administration and the Government Accountability Office to update the subcommittee on the progress we've made in our future efforts for GSA's development at the St. Elizabeth's West Campus as the DHS Consolidated Headquarters. My experience to date, as outlined in my written statement, give me a deep appreciation for the challenges of this complex development in an uncertain funding environment. And I can testify to the benefits that completion will bring to the department operationally and fiscally with your continued support. While the threats, challenges, and priorities of the department have evolved over time, the need for a consolidated headquarters is just as important today as it was when we started this effort in 2006. Five secretaries, including Secretary Nielsen, have determined that the existing DHS headquarters at the Nebraska Avenue complex is insufficient to meet the department's needs. Additionally, DHS component headquarter offices are presently scattered across 46 different locations within the NCR. Aside from the clear operational need, a consolidated headquarters offers three key benefits. Improved unity of effort through integrated decision making and collaboration across the department, more efficient use of shared resources, and greater cost savings through consolidation into long-term government-owned facilities. For the past 10 years, DHS has worked in close partnership with GSA to achieve our shared vision of building a federally owned consolidated DHS headquarters on the historical St. Elizabeth's campus. The first significant steps was the completion of the Monroe Building in 2013, now the home of Coast Guard headquarters, along with numerous support facilities. Furthermore, the National Operations Center construction is progressing within the DHS Operations Center's facility. The continued build out and transition of component operations centers to St. Elizabeth's is a foundational element of the headquarters consolidation effort. Among other efforts, we are approaching the completion of the iconic center building, which will house the DHS secretary and nearly 800 additional staff by next April. Despite all this activity and clear success, we also recognize that a project of this magnitude and complexity is not without its challenges. DHS is a large, diverse agency with a long list of critical requirements that must be met if we are to achieve continuous mission success and bring about true unity of effort. As a tenant agency, DHS is responsible for providing programmatic requirements to GSA, budgeting for and funding certain tenant specifications, reviewing GSA-managed design and construction activities, coordinating with GSA and all stakeholders on historic preservation consultations and regulatory reviews of the project, and providing oversight of, on GSA's use of DHS's funding in the execution of their responsibilities as the, as the developer. The department fully cooperates with GSA, but does not exercise acquisition, oversight, or procurement decisions related to GSA's property development activities. Clearly understanding each of our respective roles in this process is critical to providing effective program management and oversight. To that end, GAO's 2014 report on DHS headquarters consolidation provided three recommendations with respect to the St. Elizabeth program. The department concurred with all three and has taken action to address each within our, within our responsibilities, which I have outlined in my written statement. In addition to the actions we've taken to meet recommendations in the GAO report, Public Law 114150, Department of Homeland Security Headquarters Consolidation Accountability Act of 2015, requires the Secretary of Homeland Security in coordination with the GSA Administrator to submit 
to the appropriate committees of Congress information on the implementation of the enhanced plan for the Department's headquarters consolidation project within the NCR. Given the lack of FY17 and FY18 funding, the plan is misaligned, outdated, and no longer accurate. The GSA is now revisiting the enhanced plan. With the 2000 FY 2019 President's budget request, DHS Secretary Nielsen and GSA Administrator Murphy have committed the Department and GSA to continue the headquarters consolidation project by requesting funds for a new building for FEMA headquarters. In addition, GSA and DHS are working aggressively to address priority lease expirations, address certain programmatic challenges, and validate the remaining occupancy requirements. We believe the remaining development needs to focus on cost-effective construction that maximizes space utilization. DHS and GSA will update the consolidation plan, provide the congressional report, and brief our congressional committees and GAO on our future plans, including any assistance that may be necessary to successfully deliver the campus in the most mission-effective and cost-efficient manner. In closing, I'd like to assure this subcommittee that DHS is working hard to remain a good steward of taxpayers' money by managing our real estate portfolio, both government-owned and leased, in a cost-effective manner that will facilitate securing the homeland and save the American taxpayer money. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today on this important matter. I'd be pleased to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Chalecki. The chair now recognizes Mr. Gelber for his opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Perry, Ranking Member Carrera, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Michael Gelber, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner of the U.S. General Services Administration Public Building Service. Thank you for inviting me to discuss the ongoing consolidation of the Department of Homeland Security Headquarters operations on the St. Elizabeth campus in Washington, D.C. GSA's mission is to deliver value and savings in real estate, acquisition, technology, and other mission support services across the federal government. Given the current fiscal environment, GSA is working with agencies on multiple fronts to reduce and optimize the federal government's real estate footprint. This work includes reducing customer agencies' space requirements, improving space utilization, reducing real estate costs, and delivering space that allows our federal partners to more efficiently and effectively carry out their missions. For more than a decade, GSA has worked with DHS, other executive branch offices, Congress, the City of Washington, D.C., community organizations, and others to deliver a consolidated DHS headquarters at St. Elizabeth's. By substantially reducing DHS's more than 45 headquarters locations in the National Capital Region, the Department's mission effectiveness will be enhanced through co-location. This will strengthen the Department's internal and external communication, coordination, and responsiveness. The U.S. Coast Guard's move from federally leased space into, federally owned and into the federally owned and controlled Douglas A. Monroe Coast Guard Headquarters Building is an excellent example of the real and potential benefits of consolidated efforts at St. Elizabeth's. The on-time and within-budget completion of the Monroe Building delivered a modern, secure headquarters to the Coast Guard while eliminating five leases in privately owned facilities from the federal government's real estate portfolio. In addition to the completion of the Monroe Building, GSA and DHS have delivered a central utility plant which, when the current expansion is complete, will meet the energy distribution needs of the current and future campus occupants. A secure campus perimeter needed for all planned operations at St. Elizabeth's is in place, and GSA completed a 2,000-vehicle parking garage in August 2013. The current phase of the DHS consolidation is the adaptive reuse of the historic center building. In April 2019, the DHS secretary and executive leadership are scheduled to move from the Nebraska Avenue complex in northwest Washington to St. Elizabeth's. To mitigate traffic congestion in and around St. Elizabeth's, GSA is working with the District of Columbia's Department of Transportation to construct new access road extensions along with the reconstruction of the Interstate 295 Malcolm X Avenue interchange. This infrastructure work is in addition to the metro and shuttle buses that already serve St. Elizabeth's and the surrounding area. The key challenge faced by GSA with regard to this project is that constraints and uncertainties surrounding project funding have been a significant detriment to the delivery of the Consolidated Headquarters project. GSA's appropriations request, which total over $400 million for the construction of a headquarters for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, other DHS components, and additional campus infrastructure improvements were not funded in either fiscal year 2017 or 2018. Collectively, delays in appropriations have lengthened the scheduled completion date for the campus years beyond the enhanced plan's completion date of fiscal year 2021. As a result, GSA is now working with DHS to update the master plan to address the lack of recent appropriations 
the schedule of DHS commercial lease expirations, and incorporate lessons learned from the adaptive reuse of historic campus buildings. In closing, to maximize the investment to maximize the investment taxpayers have already made in the campus, GSA and DHS must continue to consolidate in a cost-effective manner as many DHS components and employees as possible onto St. Elizabeth. For that reason, we urge members of this subcommittee to seek full funding for the President's fiscal year 2019 request for St. Elizabeth of $229 million for the construction of a headquarters for FEMA. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Gelber. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Curry for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Perry, uh, Ranking Member Correa, other members of the committee. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I'd like to discuss uh, a couple things. One is our past work on the St. Elizabeth's project, but more important, the future of the project. First, like everyone here has said already, uh, we support the concept and the ideal of the consolidation. Uh, improving coordination of a huge fragmented department like DHS, saving taxpayer dollars, reducing facilities all sound fantastic. Unfortunately, ideals don't lead to success without realistic planning and execution as well. Back in September 2014, we reported on a number of problems with DHS and GSA's capital planning related to the project. For example, at that time, some consolidation plans hadn't been updated since 2006 way back when the project was originally conceived. In that report, we also recognized that a significant funding gap for the project, which back at that time was about $1.6 billion, I think the chart showed that well, was a major challenge. However, we also found that the cost and the schedule estimates weren't reliable. This is important. Um, these estimates are a key factor in Congress's funding decisions. So it's also not surprising there were concerns about fully funding the project. What we recommended is that DHS and GSA take a hard look at the project and develop a revised consolidation plan. We also recommend they develop alternatives for the remainder of the project with various construction and leasing options so Congress could understand what options were out there. And Congress agreed with our concerns and codified the recommendations, as you noted, um, in the DHS Headquarters Consolidation Act. Unfortunately, there's been little progress implementing the act or our recommendations. In fact, our concerns about this lack of progress led us to designate these recommendations among the handful of highest priority recommendations the GAO has opened, both at DHS and GSA. Um, and there's only a few of those that we, uh, so we don't do that lightly. We actually have a total of 400 open recommendations. So this tells you how important uh, we see this issue as. I think it's really important to reiterate the past, but many of these issues are even more valid today. So where are we today? Well, there's a construction going on at St. E's, as has been discussed, on the buildings that will house the secretary and top management. However, what's not being discussed, I think, is the future of the project, and that's still totally unclear. Since so much time has passed since initial planning, I think there's some really difficult questions that need to be discussed today. First, are the original efficiency and coordination benefits even still relevant if certain components won't be moving there? Second, if an expected outcome was cost savings, is that still valid given the cost increases we've seen and the new leases that are being signed? To be more specific, here's some examples of what I'm talking about. DHS and GSA are requesting $400 million this, uh, in FY19 in the budget to move FEMA into the St. E's campus. However, we found this by digging in voluminous budget documents. Without the comprehensive plan, we have no idea why this is the next step or how it fits in with the overall project. Also, the window to bring in other components may have already closed. DHS testified almost four years ago for this committee that 70% of DHS leases in the National Capital Region expired between 2016 and 2020. At the same hearing, GSA said that original consolidation plans would eliminate 50 leases. However, since then, components have signed new leases or plan to move outright to other locations, such as TSA. As a result, it's not clear that it's even possible for St. E's to be the consolidated headquarters that was originally planned. Further, these changing conditions make prior assumptions about costs null at this point. So where do we go from here? We understand that DHS expects to issue a revised plan at the end of the year. We're mandated in law to review that plan, 
uh, within 90 days, we'll do that. But I think it's important as DHS and GSA uh, develop this new plan that they really consider the lessons of the past and deliver something that's very realistic with viable alternatives for the project. Also now with years of experience building and renovating on a historic location, we would also expect the specific complexities and challenges that they've faced in doing that to be considered as the project moves forward. This concludes my statement. I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Mr. Curry. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes of questions. With that, I think I'll start with you, Mr. Curry. Um, the, I'm concerned. I'm not sure how it's going to work out, but I'm concerned there's going to be like, well, it's that guy, right? Or it's going to be, I think, you know, with all due respect, it's going to be there's a funding shortfall. And let me just discuss, let me just start there before I ask you any questions. So I've got a list of projects here that have been fully funded. Uh, I can go through a whole list of acronyms, Access Road Extension, Center Building West Edition, OHA, DNDO, and S&T relocation into the Monroe Building. I can go through a whole list of things here that are fully funded, yet not complete. And so just in layman's terms, just in layman's terms, as a person who lives a life and runs a household, like which one of you guys, which one of any of us in the room gives money to somebody that can't complete the things that we already paid for before. And then when they come and say, well, we need more money, somehow it's our fault that we didn't give you more money, even though you haven't shown the ability to complete the things we've already fully paid for, right? So that's a concern. I'm willing to listen to this argument that it's not been adequately funded, but, but I think that is questionable, at least questionable. That having been said, I'm trying to determine the relationship between DHS and, or, and DHS and, uh, and uh, uh, GSA as the developer. DHS is a tenant, right? So uh, GSA is the one that's doing the work, but DHS has requirements, and, and that's fair. I guess my larger question from your standpoint is DHS holding up GSA by changing requirements, by slow walking or not knowing what they need and then it shows up later and there have to be changes. Is this relationship, is it, is it a fair relationship and is it a sound relationship that's sincere and, and working well? Because yeah. we're looking for accountability here too. Yeah, yes sir. No, that's a great question. I, I think one thing that's important to say here from the front is that GSA works with every federal department and agency on these kinds of issues. This isn't the first, this project sure. is actually not that unique. Um, the location is unique, but, the, you know, we've been doing this for 100 years. So, um, I mean, this GSA works with every federal department and agency and has the same relationship with those agencies. So the complexities of this are, are, are not solely related to just the funding issue of this project or the location. There have been many projects in the past where there have been similar challenges. I mean, that's one of the reasons, you know, federal real property has been on GAO's high risk list for so long because it's such a diff this funding issue is such a difficult challenge to address. I mean, this is one of the reasons we always bring up these best practices in capital planning. This is why cost estimates, great planning is so important, and realistic analysis of alternatives. And I know that's, a, that's kind of a buzzword, but sure. what that means is, is do you have a menu of options if things don't go so well? And I think those are critical for you all to be able to assess. I, I don't want to be hypercritical here, and I understand that, you know, I, to a certain extent, I understand that you're digging something up, you're fixing an old building, you've got these historic preservation requirements, you run into a foundation problem. I understand and I don't understand to a certain extent, but when we did the assessment, that's part of the assessment. Can we fix this thing to standard and, and what kind of problems do we foresee? Any kind of working with an existing old structure, you're going to run into things that are, are unforeseen, and I get that. But, but like, like you said, you got to update your plans if you see something that's happened. And this is like years and years on now. And it doesn't seem like, it seems like that's used as a crutch to not get things complete as opposed to a reason, a, a, a real reason why things have changed and things have been drawn out. But my real question here, and I'm not sure I feel comfortable with the answer is, is that is, is GSA, are they, are they proceeding with, with, with the mandate that they have or, or are they be, being hindered by DHS in any way in completing this? Because I'm trying to get to some accountability here. Who's, who's dropping the ball here? Is it DHS or is it GSA? 
Well, it's hard for me to say. I, I, I don't. Well, think I doubt they're going to say right unless they. They probably work together. They don't want to point to each other, but somebody's dropping the ball. I'm trying to figure out who it is and why. Well, I mean, our recommendations we made were to both in our report in 2014. I mean, from from GSA from the standpoint of using those leading practices and the construction development, but also to DHS and making sure that it brings this project underneath its own major acquisition process so it gets equal. So I, I, I think they have equal responsibility in this. I, I think they have equal leverage in this project. Um, I, don't, I don't think one has more than the other. There are definitely distinct responsibilities, but it, it's, it's absolutely a joint project. I hate to say it, but maybe that's the problem, right? Maybe, maybe DHS should say, GSA, this is your project. Here's what we need. Tell us when it's done. And then at least we got someone to go to and say, get this done, and if you don't, here are the consequences. Right now, I think we're going to get this all day long. With that, I yield to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to follow up some of your questions and thoughts about efficiency. First of all, if you can lift this. This is essentially a chart of the funding um, or lack thereof inconsistent. Is that a factor in all of this? Well, yes, sir. I mean, we were Major factor or minor factor? Well, it, it, it's a major factor. I mean, but, but like I said before, this is this is a major factor in a lot of these capital planning projects and a lot of these construction projects in government. This is this is not a new issue, and I think, but that doesn't excuse. So we have the Act of 2015 over here that took into consideration a lot of the old inconsistencies in terms of funding. The chair was saying some of the projects were funded, some were not. We have the Coast Guard. Uh, that is essentially doing a little better job or a lot better job than the rest. Should we put the Coast Guard in charge of this project? Uh, and that's not a question to answer here, but just think about. Um, DHS versus GSA, the Act of 2015, it sounded like that Act was really supposed to get everybody to coordinate a little bit better, to acknowledge all the past inconsistencies, I'm not going to say mistakes, but maybe folks dropping a ball. It sounds like we're supposed to update the plan, change the plan. I would imagine you're supposed to do this on an ongoing basis. Uh, Private-public partnerships, where I come from, Orange County, got a little bit involved in those, and that's where the public and the private sector are always talking with each other. And as you're building, you're changing the plan because of those unforeseen circumstances So you continue to move the project forward. Here it sounds like that's not what's going on. So like the chair said, uh, how do we move ahead and, and not keep dropping the ball here? You're spending about $2 billion a year on these leases and maintenance outside. You're paving through the private sector that could be used to con you know build this out, to finish this project. Yet I'm not hearing a, a, a specific date when this whole project is going to be done. Um, what is it that we need to do? Uh, does a law have to be passed that you all come back to us every month to say how you're working together, how you're not working together? Um, it, it's not about pointing fingers. It's about saving taxpayer dollars, making sure we have the best and most efficient security that our citizens, you know, deem that they need, that they deserve, and it's not happening. Open it up for any of you to give, give us some answers here. Sir, if I, if I could just address this matter and some of the points that have been made regarding the General Services Administration and how we work with the Department of Homeland Security. We have a partnership. We have been working together on this project for an extended period of time. The significant challenge that GSA faces on this project is the lack of regular funding to actually implement the plans that we develop. Across the campus, we have spent close to $500 million on infrastructure improvements with the expectation that the campus will accommodate over 10,000 people, the current number is 12,800. So the goal is by providing a steady stream of funding year in and year out over a period of time to complete this project that will facilitate the work that we're intending to do. In 2015, in response to the GAO audit and So you're saying, sir, that this chart, this, this inconsistent funding is the major factor why things are getting held up? It's a significant issue in our ability both to plan and implement when we request money in 2016, 2017, 2018, and are only provided funding in 2016, it is difficult to then implement, build the buildings that we are proposing to build. Without money, we simply cannot proceed. The money that has been provided to us, we have created infrastructure, we have created facilities at the campus, 
as you referenced the Monroe Building, the Center Building will come online next year, where we have money, we have impl implemented and created the infrastructure that Congress has requested us to provide. So, Chalaki? Yes, sir, I would, I would, I would echo, echo GSA's concerns as well. GSA builds the buildings, and they build those buildings to our requirements. Our job is to provide clear, unambiguous requirements to GSA. What we also need is we need, we need a sequence timeline on when things will happen, because our move to St. E's is predicated on... Who provides that sequence timeline? We work together on that, because we have to line up our existing commercial leases, time those out, so we expect a building at this point, this is when our lease expires, and that's when we're prepared to move in. Now, there may be construction difficulties that move that timeline out. Um, I'm not going to say that's GSA's fault. That's not my fault. My experience that's is That's just the way it, business. That's the way it is when dealing with some of these buildings, sir. When that happens, we have to make adjustments. Uh, just like we do with the center building, we made adjustments and we're going to move forward. Sometimes those are painful. Sometimes they result in we have to consolidate in other leases where we were expecting to go into St. Elizabeth's, and that has a downstream effect to our overall plan, and that's where we are right now. Mr. Chair, I yield. Chair. Chair, thanks to gentlemen. The chair now recognizes Mr. Higgins from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, this conversation we're having today is exactly reflective of why the American citizens that we serve just stare upon Washington, D.C. in disbelief. We have, we're going to spend $4 billion, a billion is a thousand million, to house agencies uh, under one campus in this case. And so I wasn't here in 2006 when the decision was made to move what should be the most modern and responsive agency in the world into a, a, a campus that was founded in 1855. I did historical renovations in college as a carpenter. It's difficult work. When you're talking about constructing the most modern, capable, responsive, off the grid, uh, protective network of agencies in the, in the modern world, how, how are you gonna run your fiber optics? How do you run your counter espionage technologies? How do you run your surveillance technologies? Well, I wasn't here when that decision was made because I would have made a lot of noise about it. it it's, it's incredible to me that across the, the, the expanse of these United States of America, we cannot find a, a more efficient means by which and location to house a consolidated headquarters for the Department of Homeland Security and the associated agencies. Mr. Curry, you mentioned several times best practices in, in capital planning. In, in, in your wildest imaginations, you said that just they've been doing this for a long time. When would it ever be best practices in capital planning to put the most modern facility or what should be the most responsive and modern facility on the earth in a campus established in 1855. Ex explain to, to me, please, and to the American people how that could possibly be reflective of best practices in capital planning. Yes, sir. I think it's a great question. I mean, I, I think it's a good question for DHS and GSA back at the time in 2006 when the decision was made. But, I mean, one of the points we've been making is that these complexities and these challenges, especially the experience they've had so far building on this campus, have to be figured into the future because it's likely that these challenges are not going to just go away with the other buildings that are going to get renovated. And the well, other the American people want it to go away. The American people expect the federal government to operate within the, within the parameters of the revenue that we take in. We're a nation that's $20 trillion in debt. And yet we continue to have conversations and throw around numbers like $4 billion for an office complex, for Christ's sake. It's, you have the most luxurious hotels across the world built for less money with more square footage. Modern, from the ground up. I wasn't here when that decision was made in 2006. I wasn't here in 2009 when construction began. And I wasn't here in 2014 when your report was turned in. But I'm here now. 
and we're going to make some noise about this. Now, all of us are stuck with this ridiculous plan. We, we have to complete it. This committee is going to expect excellent response from the agencies responsible for spending the people's treasure on this, perhaps the worst idea in the history of best practices and capital planning ideas. I ask you, Mr. Gelber, to please give me some feedback. Leave me with something uplifting, sir. Explain to the American people how we can move forward more efficiently to complete this poorly devised and planned construction project. Well, sir, I would like to say that while GSA is working on some of the historic structures on the, on the facility, we are also in concert with the Department of Homeland Security creating those modern new office buildings that you're referencing. The Monroe facility was from a ground up construction. Our proposal for the FEMA facility would be a brand new facility that would not be engaged, if you will, or interacting with an existing historic structure. So our goal is to respond to the mission needs of the Department of Homeland Security, provide them the mission space to do their work, and to do that within the modern uh, facilities that you're referencing. And that is what we are working to do. But in order to do that, sir, we do need the money in order to proceed. Thank you for your response, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. I yield back. Chair, thanks the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gelber, can you explain, uh, forgive my ignorance, what, how, how did GSA choose St. E's as the, the ideal spot to consult, do this whole consolidation? Um, like many other site selections that we engage in, it's a variety of factors. We work with the agency that is looking for the space, and we also respond to, if you will, the tenor of the time. At that time when the Department of Homeland Security was stood up following the attacks of 9-11, there, there was a desire to co-locate the department's components in one, in one space. As we, as, and the decision is that the department, it needs to be within the, within the boundaries of the District of Columbia. So one primary area that was looked at was the St. Elizabeth's campus. It had recently been um, declared excess, no longer needed by the Department of Health and Human Services, and so it was viewed as an opportune site that was large enough, that could become secure enough to address the department's needs, Department of Homeland Security's needs, while also addressing other local community issues, including development opportunities within, within the District of Columbia. As with most site selections, we're looking to balance a variety of factors and seek what is the, idea, the, the best location that meets as many of those requirements as possible. And in coming to that determination, you, were, you had done, obviously, looked at the location, seen what kind of condition it was in, how that would affect the cost and efficiency of actually doing renovations that could give DHS what they needed. And even after looking at all of that, it was still seen to understood to be a good location. That's correct, ma'am. Primarily. So, yeah. Um, so, Mr. Curry, you said at some point when you were speaking that you expressed some doubt about St. E's actually being a place that can, going forward, be what DHS needs it to be. Can you expound on that? Absolutely. So much has changed since 2006 that I think the original ideals and the concepts that are still being discussed a lot today, this idea of what is a consolidated headquarters, I think when you, when you open up the hood and you look underneath and you look at some of the, the initial plans of who they plan to bring over to St. E's um, or pieces of certain agencies, um, at this point, we're potentially not talking about a, a headquarters where every single component is there, or the leadership of the component is there. That was the original vision. Um, that's been scaled back. Of course, I have to caveat that because we, we don't have an updated plan. You know, the last plans that we've seen are, are more than a couple years old. So I think, I, I feel like Can I just stop you right there sure. for one second? Because I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. It's what, what came first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing? I mean, is, are your concerns, um, you're saying you don't have an updated uh, report mm -hmm. about what plan should be implemented. They might say we don't have an, uh, an updated report because we don't have, we ran out of money and now we're trying to play catch up. And what, in your opinion, what came from, what, because it's, it's, it's a little frustrating. I, 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 I could close my eyes and, and 
open them and be at a VA hearing. I'm on the Veterans Affairs Committee, and I could be hearing the same thing about construction of VA hospitals mm -hmm. across this country. The same inefficiencies, the same late reports, the same, you know, God knows where the money went. So. Can you unravel that conundrum? It's a conundrum for me. I don't understand why this seems to happen every time the government is involved in rehabbing or building something. Yeah, absolutely. And no. by the way, I'm, at, I'm not bringing politics in. There's plenty of blame to go around. You know, Trump cut the money for this project. I get it. But when Democrats were in control, I'm sure we were maybe not that helpful. So this is not a political issue. Really, let's try to get to the bottom of why it is that no project like this, regardless of the federal agency that is the subject of it, ever seems to get done on time and on budget. Yeah, yeah, I can address that. So uh, I, I mentioned before that you know, federal real property has been on our high risk list at GAO for a long time, and, and this is one of the reasons. It's very difficult to have these large projects without all the funding up front to get it piecemeal and the uncertainty. There's no. There's Has no the government ever funded some, a project up front? Has uh, there ever been an instance where a report is given, everyone acknowledges, okay, this is what, like, and not, you know, a year and a half ago, and understanding that, you know, obviously costs rise. If you give an estimate on, you know, a project in 2006, it's clearly not going to cost the same in 2015 or 2018. But mm -hmm. has, that, has there ever been a, a construction project that was fully funded up front? I don't have an example for you off the top of my head. We, I can definitely get back to you with some, some specifics across different agencies, though. On that. I'm just curious, you know, whether that ever happens. But so go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I think your, your points are valid. I mean, we've said before that the funding issue is a challenge, but it's a challenge in a lot of projects. And I think one of the things we told DHS and GSA in 2014 is that understanding the funding uncertainties, which always exist, and austere budget situations, which also always exist, those have to be factored into realistic plans. And I think there have to be options going well, forward. So if we get all the funding we could hope to ever get, then, then this is the, what option A looks like when we finish. But, but if I, we I don't. Can I just you there, Mr. Kerr, because my time is running out with the chairman's indulgence. Why, is Saint, why was St. E's a good, uh, a good choice in 2006 and not in 2018? Is it technology? Is it the idea that maybe not everyone has to be co-located, physically co-located? Tell me, because that, it seems to me that if, if that's what we're talking about, and your opinion is that this should not be a campus right there, I mean, where do you go from, or, or what is your opinion? No, ma'am, I, I, I want to be clear. We're not, we don't, we don't either support or, or, or not support the idea of St. E's. I, I, we support that consolidation is a good idea for coordination's sake. I think, I think what we've looked at is the process and the practices have been used, and what we think is needed is a realistic options plan for moving forward, given the reality of the situation. You mean option as, as in an alternative other than St. E's? Well, or? just, just al alternatives in general, given the uncertainties and the complexities of the project. Even moving given forward. how much money has already been put into the project, you, you still think there should be alternatives to maybe doing something somewhere else? I, I'm not saying there needs to be something done somewhere else. I'm just saying there needs to be alternatives considering what's happened so far and the complexities of the project. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks to the gentlelady. The chair, thanks to, or cor correction, uh, recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to tip my hat to my colleague, Congresswoman Rice. And I want to also take a, a little bit of a swipe at my good friend, um, Congressman Thompson, and his statement that you might find at the back of the room if you're in the press. It says, Republicans have failed to deliver consistent funding throughout the entirety of the project, except I'm not that good at Google. Uh, having said that, this idea was conceived in 2006, that the ground was broken in 2009, and I'm pretty sure that the 111th Congress, who was original, uh, originally responsible for putting this funding forward, wasn't led by Republicans. Uh, and I could go on, but I won't, because as Ms. Rice rightly indicated, it's time to stop fixing blame and start fixing problems. So we sit here discussing the consolidation of a Department of Homeland Security tasked with defending the American people from an emerging and dynamic set of threats that aren't even the same as we could have contemplated in 2006. And I read in this report, and these are the report's words, not mine, footnoted, quote, too much emphasis may have been placed on revitalizing neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. Where in the mandates of DHS does it say we should be revitalizing neighborhoods in Washington, D.C.? That's rhetorical. 
Negotiations with historic preservationists led to a three-year delay. I note that my colleague, Mr. Thompson, fails to mention that, but it's a tragic note when we can't build an outhouse, let alone a fence across the desert, without knowing that there are going to be lawsuits. Now, none of this is targeted at you three gentlemen, but wait, because it's coming. So in 2006, the plan for consolidation emerged. Construction begins in 2009. The original estimated completion date is 2016. Then it's moved to 2021. Then it's moved to 2026. We hear, oh, it's funding, it's funding, it's funding. When I was a taxpayer, not a member of this august body, I got so sick and tired of the concept that money would solve all the problems in the world. If we can't estimate the actual cost of anything, which is what your testimony just indicated, anything accurately on the front end, then why should we even work with the numbers? What I would do as a history major, not a mathematician or an engineer, is look at cost overruns on government projects across the board, figure out what the average percentage is, and tack that crap on at the beginning so that there's a little bit of transparency and honesty for the taxpayer. But here we sit fighting with historic preservationists and revitalizing the District of Columbia's housing, which I'm not sure where it falls in the DHS mandate, but I'm pretty sure it's not there. And we got a headquarters that is designated to protect the American people from very real existential threats of death. And we're pushing numbers back from 2016 to 2021 to 2026. So here's what flummoxes me as somebody who still sort of identifies with the private sector. I'll bet you, and this question's coming, that nobody responsible for, and don't tell me about funding when there's no DHS request, none in the FY18 budget for a single dollar. And we got 135 million requested from, uh, from GSA. And don't talk to me about partisan responsibility when the blood is on both sides' hands, both sides' hands. Talk to me about who's been fired for failure to meet timelines set by law by this body. A name, one name of one person who's been held to account. Anybody been fired? Has anyone been reprimanded? One name. Has anyone responsible for meeting these deadlines, who's failed to meet these deadlines, been subsequently promoted? I mean, I, sometimes I wonder why we're here. And again, not targeting you three gentlemen, but at some point, again, and I would again tip my hat across the aisle to Congresswoman Rice, it is time to stop fixing blame and start fixing problems. The Department of Homeland Security should not be in the business of revitalizing D.C. neighborhoods, and we should not be building multi-billion dollar facilities where we know that we're going to have three-year-long delays because of historical preservationists. Consolidation, good idea. Communication, good idea. Might have saved lives on 9-11. But all this is reasonably foreseeable. Overrun on cost, it's, it's as predictable as the swallows returning to San Juan Capistrano. How can we do it differently? I apologize for the soliloquy. But we have to change the paradigm. I want you gentlemen, please, and I mean this sincerely and with all due respect, and a lot is due, to start looking for ways to do things differently, to start looking for ways to hold people to account. When you go home at night and you know you can't be fired for failure to meet a deadline that is, in fact, the law of the land, what's your motivation, right, to steal a Hollywoodism? So, I, again, my tone as it relates to you three individuals who are probably not directly personally responsible, I, I, I apologize. But when we're spending DHS money to revitalize neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., God forbid there's a cascading cyber attack tomorrow. God forbid that there's some sort of unconventional terror attack involving chemical or biological threats that might have been precluded had we had consolidation and communication across lines tomorrow. Because who do we have to blame? And I say we, not you, us. We have us to blame. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please, I don't want to do this again in five years. They were doing this in 2013. I don't want to do this again in 2022, 2023. I don't. Thank you. How fortuitous. The chair thanks the gentleman and now recognizes the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes. Thank you, Mr. This, this is a, a monumental project. A lot of times monumental projects 
uh, struggle to be successful. And uh, I know I missed part of the introductory comments, but thinking through of how do we best use our resources in moving, moving forward in, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish uh, in, in terms of spending the taxpayer resources in, in the right manner, making sure that we look at all of our different unique agency needs through that as well. So I guess my question more centers around, um, and, and I apologize if some of this was, was mentioned before, but is there, is there the strategic plan to say how do, we, how do we make sure we address the different needs of the agencies and consolidate and making those more effective moving forward? Sir, if I could address that, and obviously my colleagues can if they wish as well. Um, our intent, we fully agree with the Government Accountability Office, is to develop a new plan to move forward with this project. The previous plans have been created to become out of date because of changes in circumstances, primarily the lack of funding. Um, our goal is to have a plan that is as responsive as possible to the uncertainties that we face, but also meets the mission needs of the Department of Homeland Security. Prior to your, to your arrival, there were references, and I do want to clarify this, um, when GSA has been provided money for this project, we have used that money and created the infrastructure we have promised and committed to do as per the law. Um, we have all, some of that work has been on time and on budget. Some of that work has occurred, um, unfortunately, as delayed, and currently the center building is delayed, and we acknowledge that delay. But our goal is to work with the Department of Homeland Security, create a new plan that addresses their mission needs, which have by, by and large not changed since the inception of this project, but also address the realities of working within that campus that has been identified to date. Um, GSA, the Department of Homeland Security, the American taxpayer, has expended close to $500 million at this facility to create infrastructure. To walk away from that infrastructure at this point, while that's possible, in GSA's opinion, would not be appropriate because it would lose the opportunities that we've created by the work that we've done to date at that facility. You, you just mentioned and, and again, I apologize if, if it was brought up before in terms of the dollar amounts, but you mentioned a lack of money uh, in, in previous. Can, can we talk through that in terms of what either we've not done, what expectations were set differently that as a legislative and executive branches uh, planned for and, and appropriated for versus what the needs and, and where do, how do we make sure that we make ourselves in a line moving forward so that that, that is addressed. Uh, understood, sir. In 2014, GAO issued a report requesting an effective plan for this facility. In 2015, the Department of Homeland Security and GSA developed what we refer to as the enhanced plan. That plan was predicated on a four-year funding stream, fiscal year 16, fiscal year 17, fiscal year 18, and fiscal year 19. The intent was that with the money provided in fiscal year 16, we could complete some existing infrastructure at the facility Fiscal year 17, we plan to use that money for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Fiscal year 18, we plan to use that money for the uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, organization. And in fiscal year 19, we plan to use that money for Customs and Border Protection. Fiscal year 16, we received the money we requested, and we've been using that money as we said we would. Fiscal year 17, we did not receive the money for FEMA, which then led us to have to revise our plan which no longer made it possible for us to consider the funding for the ICE headquarters or the CBP headquarters. So as a result, and understandably, these are difficult times in terms of budget discussions and how funding is available. I understand difficult decisions need to be made, but the impact of those decisions on this particular project is that our goals for FEMA, ICE, and CBP have not been able to be implemented, and that is why DHS and GSA are now working to develop a revised plan to see how we can best move forward. So, and, and I, I don't want to rehash things that have happened years ago. Um, I mean, obviously, when, when I, I, I won't use the term the rug gets pulled out from under you, but when um, either directions change from, from a funding approach, how, how's the, the process work to come back and say, okay, that four-year plan needed to be changed, and how do we, how do we approach that now moving forward? And, and the way we approach that now, at least from GSA's perspective, is we are working with DHS to develop a new master plan for the facility that will count the realities of where we are and what we've learned with our construction at the campus. 
account where we are with the various lease facilities that we have with DHS around the Washington, D.C. area, and, and with DHS's input working together, develop a new plan for the facility that says, here's the level of infrastructure that we can create at the St. Elizabeth campus, and once that infrastructure, those buildings are built, here are the entities from DHS that will be able to be moved in. And our goal, working with DHS, is to develop that plan during this calendar year and then present it as in response, uh, as DHS has been requested under, their, under the statute to provide that plan. Thank, thank you. My, my time's up. I yield back. I'm going to go for another round for anybody who wants to stick around. Uh, I might be short in my questions, but let me turn to Mr. Chalecki here. The Monroe Building reconfiguration was fully funded, unless you tell me it's not, but that's my understanding, so correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in 2016 at $26.7 million. What's the current status of that project? Uh, yes, sir. It was fully funded in 2016. So what we've been looking at is working with the Coast Guard to um, to look at what are the options going forward. So where we are right now is Coast Guard has a number of concerns with moving other folks in there. And right now we're looking at CWMD or science and technology as possible tenants to go in there. Um, so we're looking at the range of options in terms of number of people we can go in, seat configurations, all of those things. Coast Guard has serious reservations about this. And from, that's what we've been working on with the Coast Guard is to determine What's, what's the feasible, what's the best alternative going forward? When was forward? that project supposed to be completed, if you know? I believe uh, around 2018, yes, sir. All right, so 2018, and just for the record, again, not to, I agree with both sides here. I mean, look, we got our differences here in this room, uh, but the one thing I think we all have in common is we're, we're pretty frustrated with the circumstances here. So uh, there's 26.7 million fully funded, not done. What about the, uh, the ramp? Uh, on the access ramp or the road extension on uh, I-295. What's the story there? That is, that is a project that the General Services Sorry. Administration is managing. We are, have uh, worked with the District Department of Transportation to construct that road, that interchange. The district has um, reported to us that they plan to award that contract within the next 60 to 45, excuse me, 45. That was funded in 2015, right? When was that supposed to be complete? Um, the intent of that was to be completed in 2017, uh, the reason it was not was we were in our work with the district. It took longer than we had expected and planned. The, the benefit of that road is tied to the various infrastructure that I've referenced. And the fact, uh, um, while the project is delayed, the, re the reality is that that road is not necessary until these other components are relocated to the campus. Yeah, but you, you kind of get my point here, right? Understood, you get sir. my point. I mean, fully funded, but still not done, yet you're saying that the reason that these things aren't, that the other issues aren't completed is because they're not fully funded. Yet when you are fully funded or when they are fully funded, it doesn't seem to make a difference. Let's talk about some options here. This is, St. Elizabeth is a national historic landmark and I've been there and, and the place is magnificent. The site is magnificent, the buildings are magnificent and majestic. However, however, I just hate, I shudder to say this because I love all that old stuff and I mean that. What, what is the cost of tearing that stuff down and just building the building? Is that, is that one of the options, as Mr. Curry has talked about options? Is that a viable option? Are there option? Are there um, unknown or, well, if you're unknown, you can't ask you that, but are there currently unseen but maybe known or suspected uh, toxic dumping sites on the, on the site that are going to have to be remediated? What, what is what are the other options? I mean, like I said, I shudder to think about it, but I feel like we're getting, all we're doing with, with the respect to the American taxpayer's money is throwing this money down a rat hole. So there is physical space on the campus to construct new buildings. There are also, as you referenced, historic structures on the campus. Can they be torn down or must they be maintained? They, do not, they are not required to be maintained. Our approach has been to save what we can and, do, and, and complete what we refer to as adaptive reuse, which is to take the historic structure and use it for modern purposes. When that is possible, we work to do that given the requirements that we have with the National Capital Planning Commission, the uh, National Environmental Policy Act, and the Historic Preservation Act. So we have to comply with those statutes when dealing with a historic property to do all we can to either preserve or document the historic nature of that property. 
regarding toxic issues or any types of hazardous waste, we are not aware of to this date of any types of hazardous chemicals or wastes on the site. That has not been the challenge to date. The, date, uh, to, the challenge to date has been modifying historic structures to accommodate modern needs. Sure, and we, just like uh, the gentleman from uh, Louisiana said, he worked as a carpenter, that restoring old stuff is tough, long, hard, arduous work that not many people, there, there's not, you know, they were built a couple hundred years ago now, and there's not people that do that kind of stuff the way it was done. That So we get that, but the question I have is, is that has it ever been in the list of options there's a footprint there where the buildings currently stand. You either fix them and move into them, or you destroy them and, uh, and build a new thing, a new building on that site or somewhere close by. But you can't just let it sit there languishing and falling down and being a, a safety hazard, et cetera. Uh, is that one of the options that was ever considered? Is it considered now? Is it part of the consideration as we move forward to, to tear a portion of those buildings down and use that space to build new stuff? I mean, you do have underground infrastructure to them, whether it's water, sewer, electricity, it's already located there. So, I mean, there's at least a savings there, but you got this big edifice you got to deal with. So, as we develop the, the plan that we plan in concert with the Department of Homeland Security, we are looking at the full spectrum of opportunities regarding those properties. Um, and the, the potential to demolish the property is an option, but it is also in the same spectrum, if you will, to reuse the property. So we are looking at all those things as we look at the, based on what we've learned at the center building and our experience with working at the center building, what's the viability of continuing to use the historic structures at the site. But in order for us to make a determination on that matter, GSA, the Department of Homeland Security, we have to work with a, a series of entities across the Washington DC area through the National Capital Planning Commission process to ensure that whatever decision we make is in uh, consort, if you will, with those other entities' um, objectives. I thank you for your answers. One way over time, I now recognize the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have some questions. Before I get to my questions, I just wanted to uh, just point out a, a point of procedure of decorum, Mr. Chairman. That is, our learned colleague from Virginia called Mr. Thompson by name, and I hope next time we do those kinds of things, you wait till that member is present so they can at least respond to the statements that are made uh, uh, using their name. I just think Noted. it's disrespectful just to you know, call out another person when not around to defend themselves. With that being said, I, I wanted to get back to the gentleman here, and, and you know, a lot has been talked about here, and I come back to the question I start out with. Is this plan still valid? Is this plan still important towards the goal of enhancing American security? Is this plan of consolidating these agencies a more effective way of protecting our citizens? And if it is, I mean, we talk about a new plan, a new, you know, goal, set of goals. I would say it's more revising the existing plan, not starting from scratch, but going back and revising based on the circumstances. And are we 30% complete on this, 50% complete? We've sunk billions of dollars into this project. How many more billions is it going to take for us to finish? And how much are we going to save in terms of paying rent leases outside to private sector versus uh, investing in, in, these, in this project to complete this project, so to speak? Open it up. Uh, to answer your first question, sir, uh, this is absolutely what DHS wants to continue to do. Um, Consolidation is... This is what DHS wants to do because this is in furtherance of national security? Exactly. Consolidation is very important to us. It's as, it's as relevant today as when the department first stood up. My goal is to get as much DHS headquarters consolidated as possible. St. E's right now is, is our best solution going forward from both an operational standpoint and a fiscal standpoint. Operationally, we're combining our operations centers Joint operations is important to us. Just having, having folks sit next to one another is, is a critical way for us to do business for the national security reasons that you point out. Fiscally, uh, if, if we're inside federally owned facilities, that's a cost savings for us. Commercial leases widely dispersed is not helpful. It's so much easier for the secretary to have her leadership walk across the street than have to cross town just to have a conversation. Um, this is where the Department of Homeland Security has been steadfast on. 
They want to, they, we need to keep going in this direction, um, and we support any effort that we can to revise this plan to see how much we can get onto that campus going forward. I think what we have to do, sir, is we have to take a look at the revised master plan that GSA spoke about and take a look and see what's the possible scenarios going forward. The enhanced plan is just, it's not, it's not a workable solution anymore. One of the reasons that you point out is we were going into a lot of those historical buildings. The lessons learned from the center building point to we need to revisit those. So I have, to, I have requirements. I know what those requirements are. Question is, what kind of a safe, efficient building can we get to house those requirements? The others, Mr. Mr. Gilbert. Yeah, and given uh, our our role is to respond to the mission, the mission requirements, the space requirements of the agencies we work with. DHS has articulated their need. Our goal is to work and meet that need at the St. Elizabeth's campus. Um, the focus that we have is to develop a plan that allows us to use the dollars that we might be able to get to create the office space that would allow the DHS components that DHS wishes to, to locate at the campus to be built to, to be housed there. In, in terms of percentages, um, the enhanced plan created the following spectrum. This is a, a three-year-old plan. We had spent $1.5 billion to date, and our expectation at the time was that we would need an additional $800 million $800 million to proceed. That plan is now the one we need to, re to look at and revise given the passage of time and the potential change of requirements that DHS may have, coupled with what we have learned in terms of our work at this campus. Mr. Curry, is this still a project vital necessary to our national security? Well, sir, you know, our job at GAO is to help you all evaluate how good of a job the agencies are doing in implementing their mission you know, what, but you what, did make some statements questioning the validity of this project. Sir, it, the, the statements I made were not so much about questioning whether St. Elizabeth's is the right choice or not. What we've looked at is the processes that have been used to develop this project and to manage it. The concerns we've had are about how it's been managed, but our bigger concerns about, are about the future. We want to see if this project continues to go forward and get funding, we want to see it managed well and the funding to be used effectively. So uh, without, a, without an updated plan, though, right now, it's hard to answer the percentage question because we don't even know right now what the end state looks like. We know what it looked like back in 2006, but the end state is not clear, and that's, that's what I'm raising today. I think that has to be discussed and figured out. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Chair, thanks to gentleman. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Kansas. <clears throat> Mr. Gilbert, I, a, a couple questions for you. Um, when you were just talking with uh, Mr. Correa, you made, you made the comment around we spent $1.5 and expected another $800 million at that point in time. Now we're talking about $3.7 billion for the entire project. Isn't that what we're looking at? Is that, are the, am I not adding the right numbers together to, to, to compare apples to apples? The first two figures you mentioned were obviously the ones I just said. The, the 3.7, uh, I guess the question for, for me is where we are today, that, that those numbers that I presented were based on a plan developed in 2015. We have not been able to implement that plan. What we're in the process of doing with the Department of Homeland Security is developing a new plan which would have the cost estimates associated with going forward. It would, it would capture what we would have spent to date, but also state here's how much money we need in order to proceed. But the, 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 the way those numbers tie in that we plan to propose um, with what we've presented to date, th those numbers will be different for the, for the reasons I've stated previously. So we don't have the total plan laid out of where we go from here, but the best estimate that we have today is that is looking at to be the 3.7 billion, is that? I wouldn't tie I wouldn't tie ourselves to a 3.7 number because the new the, the plan that we're going to be developing will have its own independent cost estimate associated with that. We we agree with GAO that there is a need for a plan and there is a need to develop cost estimates associated with that plan before we come forward and request funding for those that work. Well, yeah, I, I guess I've not been here very long, um, trying to wrap my arms around lots of things. I've been involved in, in a few major projects, whether it's a, a state capital renovation or an airport renovation, and, and understand the dynamics and understand thinking through those, those um, 
pitfalls that you get into that you have to adjust the plan as, as you go along. But, you know, we're kind of sitting here now trying to figure out how do we move forward? I mean, we've put a lot of time, we put a lot of money, uh, we're not seeing the results. And I know the sense of the body has been some frustration. There's probably frustration in, in the department, in the GAO as well, in terms of where we are and how do we get to where we need to be. And I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how do we, how do we best move forward. And, and one mention was made earlier was, you know, tear down some of the old buildings and start from scratch. I mean, the, the thought that's gone in my head is, is this the right location? I mean, I, I understand the concept of having uh, the whole department together. There's, there's certainly some value in that. I, I know space is at a, at a premium to finding a space big enough for the department, uh, just from that size, uh, just from that standpoint. But I, I don't know, when you go through the plan, is, are, is the intention going to be how to make the current design and is that the direction of the plan? Are you going to look at, is this the right space again? Is this, is this uh, our right needs? Is it, uh, um, what's the scope, I guess, of the planning process from here? From GSA's perspective, the scope of the plan would be how can we best use the St. Elizabeth's campus to meet the needs of the Department of Homeland Security, given everything we've learned to date and given what their mission requirements are for the facility. So our sense is the, the, the envelope, if you will, of that campus is the area we're working with, within. And our goal is to make the best use of that envelope, given everything we've learned to date and given everything we've done to date at that facility. And, and again, I apologize for asking this question, but uh, it may have been answered already. But when's the expectation of that plan being completed so that we can, I mean, the, the draft of the plan so that we can actually say this is the, what it takes and what it costs in the time frame? And Working with DHS, GSAs um, together, our expectation is to complete that plan this calendar year, to work to complete that plan this calendar year. So from, from our expectation or from our standpoint on this committee, um, is that once that plan's prepared, I assume it flows up through the department for approval, does it then bring it back to our committee for discussion around what do we do? Is that the plan we want to proceed with and move forward or, or where's, where's the the authorization to move forward, and, and I'm, I'm not sure who's best to, to ask that question for from, from that, from a planning and planning and next step and execution process. When normally documents of this nature, in this case, the Department of Homeland Security and GSA, we would in effect um, clear that, vet that document through both our individual agencies as well, as well as with other components of the executive branch. And then my understanding is, again, not here to speak for D Department of Homeland Security, but they would submit the plan to the committee for the committee's review. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, thanks, a gentleman. Kind of one final parting thought question. DHS is more than a year and a half late in submitting a congressionally mandated report det detailing the path forward for St. Elizabeth, which in a way I think would encompass elements or substantially uh, the plan that Mr. Estes was just talking about, right? That's, that's what we'd see. Uh, I, I'm, at this point, I'm not even going to ask why, but maybe I should. Is there a reason why? I mean, can somebody? Yes, sir. The, the enhanced plan, the assumptions that it was based on, the timelines, the cost estimates, they're no longer valid. Okay. Uh, why couldn't we at least get that report? And I mean, we're a year and a half late. And I, I guess that I, I asked that in the context of I'm going to submit some questions for the record after the fact here because I want to keep everybody here. Look, the last thing I want to have you guys doing is sitting in some office answering my questions. I prefer you to be like getting this thing done, right? But our, our job is to watch over this stuff and make sure the taxpayer's money is spent correctly. So we got to get these questions answered. So um, is, is this report that's now in a year and a half late, what we can expect, when can we expect to see that? Is that what Mr. Gelber was talking about as well in the revised plan that's going to be done this calendar year, understanding it's April and we have until December, you know, the end of December in this calendar year? So what's the story there? Uh, yes, sir. The, the revised master plan, that's what's going to generate this report because that's going to be the GSA DHS way forward on the St. E's campus. Okay. All right. Well, Chair thanks the witnesses for their valuable testimony. No. I yield.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to follow up on the Chairman's comments and, and questions, which is uh, how long are we going to have to wait to the next report? And if we don't know the answer to that, can we have you all come back and tell us what you have in terms of the report and what revisions you've made and what you think you need to do? I, I just uh, you know, don't want to wait till next quarterly earning or next annual report from you. Can we do something midterm, meaning in the next few weeks? Tell us where you're at, what you're thinking this is going to be, and what you don't think it's not going to be. I, I feel like we're, we're, you know, missing something. I, I, I don't like um, thinking that this report is a year and a half late and we don't have anything. Am I missing something? Regarding, you know, meeting with your office and meeting with your, um, your staff, GSA is more than able and willing to do that and provide you the, uh, the updates and information that you, you would be requesting. Yes, sir. I feel like it's my fiduciary duty to know what's going on, so if you could help me out here a little bit, uh, clarify some things for me. And finally, as part of the updated report, um, St. Elizabeth, not sure why it was named St. Elizabeth, but uh, I know our president, uh, when 911 occurred, was George W. Bush. So I'd like to ask the committee to consider naming the St. Elizabeth area uh, after our, our President George W. Bush, because he was president, the man in charge, when our country was, was attacked and he responded accordingly. So I'd like to have that considered for the record. Instead of calling it St. Elizabeth, call it the George W. Bush DHS headquarters. I yield, Mr. Chair. Chair thanks the gentleman. The chair thanks the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. Members may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to these in writing. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7D, the hearing record will remain open for 10 days. Without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned.